Hi, this is David Miller, here with the third of five mini-lectures on Philip Pullman's novel, The Golden Compass. And today we're going to talk about burning down the house. Last time at the end of the first movement in part two, we arrived with Lyra at Bulvangar, a.k.a. the experimental station. The second movement opens as she sizes up her new surroundings. Lyra is well served in this setting by her skill as a practiced liar, and we see from the start that she is both more resourceful and more courageous than any of the doctors or nurses who run the station. As Lyra observes of Sister Clara, she would be able to stitch a wound or change a bandage, but never to tell a story, and she is certainly no match for a first-class 11-year-old liar. I've mentioned several times the way Lyra gradually takes control over the course of events, sometimes by active reading and sometimes by telling stories. Here at Bolvangar, she comes into her own both as a reader and a storyteller, playing dumb as Lizzie Brooks while outsmarting the adults around her. Her edge over them is made clear in what I confess is one of my favorite small moments in the novel. Listen, children, he said. Listen carefully. Every so often, we have to have a fire drill. It's very important that we all get dressed properly and make our way outside without any panic. So we're going to have a practice fire drill this afternoon. When the bell rings, you must stop whatever you're doing and do what the nearest grown-up says. Remember where they take you. That's the place you must go to if there's a real fire. Well, thought Lyra, there's an idea. Lyra has learned almost immediately that there's little time to act. Mrs. Coulter is due to arrive the next day. She takes advantage of the confusion created by the fire drill to explore the premises above ground. With the help of Roger, Billy Costa, and the goose demon Kaisa, she discovers and releases the caged demons of severed children. The final pair of chapters in this movement unfolds as Mrs. Coulter arrives to inspect the work of the station. Lyra climbs into the ceiling ducts, again her experience at Jordan College climbing over steepled roofs and down into catacombs serves as a model and she eavesdrops on Mrs. Coulter's meeting with the staff. Once Mrs. Coulter has left the room, Lyra overhears the doctors talking about her. Her attitude worries me. Not philosophical, you mean? Exactly. A personal interest. I don't like to use the word, but it's almost ghoulish. That's a bit strong. But do you remember the first experiments when she was so keen to see them pulled apart? Lyra is so shocked and repulsed by this that she can't help making a noise. The doctors capture her, and in the process she comes in for a second shock, for in capturing her the doctors violate the great taboo. And suddenly all the strength went out of her. It was as if an alien hand had reached right inside her where no hand had a right to be and wrenched at something deep and precious. She felt faint, dizzy, sick, disgusted, limp with shock. That's a powerful moment, isn't it? Pullman has creatively transformed some of the main themes and concepts of Freudian psychoanalysis. I mentioned earlier that intercision, because it's meant to prevent sexual maturation, is a form of castration. Freud, of course, was not talking about physically removing the genitals. For him, castration is a psychic phenomenon. What's interesting about Pullman's reinvention of these themes is that he makes castration at once more physical and more spiritual than it is in Freud. Tony Makarios is described as mutilated and as a half-boy because his demon isn't there. But her presence is both physical, since demons have bodies you can see, 
and spiritual since they are bound so closely to their humans. Remember in Trollicent when Lyra was afraid to approach Yorick Burnison and Pan forces her to do it? He does this by tugging at the invisible bond between them. The mysterious anguish Lyra experiences in that moment, half physical pain and half intense sadness, captures perfectly the mixed nature of the tie that binds humans in this world to their companion souls. You can see that the taboo against touching another person's demon mixes the physical and the spiritual in a similar way. The language describing that alien hand as it violates Lyra is carefully designed to suggest sexual molestation where no hand had a right to be, even as it transforms this idea into something more spiritual. We know in our world what it is belonging to another person that you are not supposed to touch, and these associations are crucial to the meaning of the scene, but it's equally crucial to see how Pullman insists on a certain difference. This transformation of Freud that I've been describing goes to the heart of Pullman's vision in this trilogy. Remember how he revisits Milton's description of the dark materials out of which God created the universe, but then uses the concept of dark matter for modern astrophysics in order to transform the traditional philosophical distinction between matter and spirit? In the traditional model, creation happens when a purely spiritual agent imposes form on a lifeless, chaotic mass. And this duality of matter and spirit, like that of body and soul, derives from an ancient metaphysics, which Christianity inherits from the Greek philosopher Plato. Pullman fundamentally revises that ancient duality by making matter itself a living, creative, conscious force, in this way denying any distinction between matter and spirit. He follows through on this by denying the distinction between body and soul as well. This is why he treats human sexuality and human spirituality as the same thing. His transformation of psychoanalytic ideas about castration and the sexual taboo follow directly from this fusion of the sexual and the spiritual. Lyra, of course, passes quickly from the violation of the great taboo to the brink of castration in the following scene. Here, Pullman gives us the first of two scenes that reenact the Akedah, the averted sacrifice of Isaac from the book of Genesis. The doctors have placed Lyra into the silver guillotine that gives the chapter its title, and they are about to sever her from Pantalamian. Just as the angel of the Lord stops Abraham at the last moment, so Mrs. Coulter arrives to prevent Lyra's sacrifice. Back in Mrs. Coulter's quarters, Lyra recovers enough self-possession to lie fluently about her adventures since fleeing from the flat in London. This belongs to the ongoing development of Lyra's powers as a narrator. For as her narrator remarks, she had to be an artist, in short. At the same time, she sees through Mrs. Coulter's lies and despises her for them. The first time they met, Mrs. Coulter was clearly in control, first charming Lyra and then bullying her. But now the tables are turned. When her mother tries to confiscate the alethiometer, Lyra's trick wins, surprising Mrs. Coulter with the same mechanical fly spy she herself had sent after Lyra. Now from this point on, the action of part two moves quickly to its climax. Bolting out of Mrs. Coulter's quarters when the fly spy attacks, Lyra hits the fire alarm, starts a fire in the kitchen, and grabs her furs. Since the first fire drill, the children have all been alerted to grab their warm clothes and run when they hear the fire alarm. And this exit launches the climactic battle scene in which Lyra, with help from Yorick, the Egyptians, the witches, and Lee Scoresby, manages to destroy Bolvangar and free the children. The battle is magnificent, but one of its finest moments comes before the various cavalries arrive to save the day. 
Lyra has led the children into the snow, escaping from the station, when they're confronted by a phalanx of Tartar fighters with their wolf demons. Lyra thought with despair, children can't fight soldiers. It wasn't like the battles in the Oxford clay beds hurling lumps of mud at the brick burners' children. Or perhaps it was. She remembered hurling a handful of clay in the broad face of a brick burner boy bearing down on her. He'd stopped to claw the stuff out of his eyes, and then the townie slept on him. She'd been standing in the mud. She was standing in the snow. Just as she'd done that afternoon, but in deadly earnest now, she scooped together a handful and hurled it at the nearest soldier. Get him in the eyes, she yelled, and threw another. Lyra is a thoroughly modern heroine with more Lucy Lawless than Elizabeth Bennet in her bones. Part two ends with Lyra, Roger, and Yorick aloft in Lee Scoresby's balloon. They're being pulled by the witches towards Svalbard, where Lyra will help first Yorick and then Lord Asriel to achieve their destinies. But in the midst of this sense of triumph and adventure, one note of troubling uncertainty remains. What exactly is the destiny Lyra will help Lord Asriel achieve? She's been taking this for granted, and maybe we have too, but when Serafina Pekala asks her why she's going, it turns out she's a bit confused on this point. Lyra was astonished to take him the alethiometer, of course, she said. She had never considered the question. It was obvious. Then she recalled her first motive from so long ago she'd almost forgotten it. Or to help him escape, that's it. We're going to help him get away. But as she said that, it sounded absurd. Escape from Svalbard? Impossible. Try anyway, she added stoutly. Why? You remember I said that Lyra's close call in the silver guillotine was the first of two scenes in which the novel reenacts the binding of Isaac by Abraham, which takes place, by the way, on the top of Mount Moriah, where Yahweh has instructed Abraham to journey with his son. Next time, we'll talk about this second scene.